We humans have to trust robots in order to live. Or should we? And when should all of us interact with artificial intelligence medical systems to improve our health and wellness? These are questions I've been working on in my journey to develop advanced medical technologies. It all started 15 years ago. I was sitting at my daughter's bedside. She was six years old at the time, and she was having an asthma attack. She was scared, and so was I. Nothing is more frightening and frustrating for a parent than to see his child struggling for breath without being able to help. We all take breathing for granted. We don't think about it until there is a problem. We are not aware that hidden in our breath is a treasure of information in our unique pattern, shape, and speed of breathing. So take a breath with me, a big one. Go ahead. And with that breath, let's jump in. In the struggle to improve my daughter's breathing, we tried everything. Different doctors, different medications. We even had her stand in front of an open refrigerator and breathe the cold air because somebody told us it would help her asthma. It didn't. But what we did learn from doctors, that if we can give an early morning, if we can know a little bit ahead of when the attack is coming, the same medication will be dramatically more effective. In fact, 90% of hospitalizations of children with asthma can be prevented by knowing just four hours ahead that the attack is coming and giving the same medication. And that's true not just, not just for asthma, also for heart attacks, congestive heart failures, infections, sepsis, and problems related to pain medication. Over half a million people, 500,000 people, die from that every year, and we can save them. We can save them all with early warning. I knew that doctors don't have the only answer. We have to work with them to solve this problem. So I joined a colleague uh, who is also a father of a son with asthma, and with him, we co-founded a company that I led that's focused on saving lives by developing early warning artificial intelligence medical systems. First thing we needed, we knew, was information, and lots of it. That's when we thought of the fairy tale of the princess and the pea. You remember the story. A princess knocks on the door of a castle one dark night. No one believes that she is a princess, so they put her in a bed with many mattresses and a small pea beneath that. So we decided to develop a sensor that is like that pea and goes under the mattress of a bed and through the mattress, actually through multiple mattresses, will detect every motion, every heartbeat, every breath. This sensor can actually say, every breath you take, I'll be watching you. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe somebody should write a song about that. <laughs> so we developed that sensor, that pea-like sensor, and we, instead of the princess feeling the pee, we had the pee sense the information from, the, from my princess. And with that little sensor, we built a big database. We got big data, and we had the biggest, and we have the biggest database in the world of heart and breathing signals. So now that we have the data, we want to use it to change medical outcomes. We want to change the future of patients. In order to, do, to change the future, we need to predict it. So we got a team together of mathematicians, algorithm people, computer uh, people, and doctors. Yes, doctors, because I believe that the combination, cooperation of doctors and engineers is where the magic happens. That's when we solve the real tough medical problems. So we got them together to develop advanced medical algorithms to predict the future of patients. And we built it a little bit like the computer, sorry, the human brain works. So the human brain analyzes data points and can see patterns. We did the same with our algorithms, but where the brain can do that on hundreds of points, these artificial intelligence algorithms do that on billions and billions of data points. And it actually works. Here is an example. 
What you see here on the, on the screen is the uh, pattern of information of a 55-year-old man from the Netherlands who had a heart attack. At the end of the graph on the right, where the graphs end, that's when the heart attack happens. In red, by the way, is the heart signal, and in blue is the breathing signal. The heart attack happens at the end, but where you see the white circle, that's where the algorithms already predict that the heart attack is coming. So the algorithms can tell eight hours before that this person is very likely to have a heart attack. That's when we can, where we can intervene and save his life. So we have the ability, we have the technology to sense information and to predict what's likely to happen to patients. It turns out that's the easy part. The tough part is then using that information to drive change in care and get actual better medical results to actually save lives. So when we, uh, when we understood that, when we realized that that's the challenge, we started to look what is limiting, why is it that once we have the ability to predict the future, we still find it challenging to drive change in health behavior and get better results. So we found out that there are three reasons. The first, is that we humans, when we get messages and alerts from medical system and, and medical machines, we don't respond quickly enough. And why don't we respond quickly enough? First of all, because these machines are spamming us. They're generating too many false alarms. They are, uh, if you go into any emergency room in a hospital anywhere in the world, the first thing you notice is incessant blinking and flashing hundreds of thousands, up to a million alarms sent at the doctors and nurses, most of them false alarms. A little bit like the uh, story of the boy who cried wolf. Too many false wolf stories, so when the actual alarm comes in, people don't respond to it. So that's on the machine side, too many false alarms. But there is also a human element here, and that goes to how we handle news. So think of yourself at home. When do you look at your bank account? According to Columbia University research, if you're like most people, if you're like me, you look at your bank account only when you expect to see good news. <laughs> now, that's not a great way to handle your bank account, and certainly not a great way to handle our medical care. Um, in medical care, we actually call it sometimes the ostrich effect. Bad news comes in, we put our head in the sand. It's even, even more complex than that. News that doesn't fit our picture of what is happening to the patient or to ourselves, and we push it out. So because of this ostrich effect and the uh, cry-wolf effect, we don't respond quickly enough to alerts coming in from artificial intelligence medical systems and not saving enough lives. So that's one point. The second point is that we actually do too much treatment, too much medical care. In the research we did with the University of Chicago, we found out that when you analyze the risk of patients with our algorithms, more than 50% of patients in the hospital are doing well. They're stable, and they don't need our intervention. All we need to do is let them be, and they'll recuperate on their own. But because of standard protocols, doctors and nurses go through the, the care, waste their time, wake them up, for example, in the middle of the night to take their vital signs, even though they would be better just sleeping. So on one hand, we are not responding quickly enough to real alerts that are coming at us, and on the other hand, we are caring too much for patients that the algorithms are telling us we should let be. And what we understood is that these two key issues are actually based on one more fundamental challenge, which is the actual missing link in medical artificial intelligence. And that is trust, or the lack of it. We humans are not willing yet to trust in the artificial intelligence of medical systems and change our care based on that information. So when we understood that, we decided to add an additional layer of technology on top of the sensor and the predictive ability, a layer that would focus on the connection with the human element, a layer that would focus on trust. 
And with, did, with that, we reduced the number of false alarms. We worked on the communication between the system and the human element and made sure that we do everything we can to build the trust of the doctors, nurses, and people at home in our technology. And with that, when that was done, we started seeing outstanding results. Here's an example. A 62-year-old woman in Massachusetts was given pain medication. Now, pain medication is great for reducing pain, but has complications where it sometimes reduces the breathing and actually leads the breathing to stop. And when that happens, patients usually die. This woman was monitored with a sensor. And what you see here is her signal. Again, in red is the heart, and in blue is the breathing. At this point, where you see the white circle, the algorithms started alerting that this woman is going in what is called respiratory arrest. She's likely to stop breathing and likely to die. The good news is that the doctor believed and trusted the system, changed the medication of this woman, and saved her life. Now, let's look very closely at this signal. Look at that, where that white circle is. See, look for the change in the signal there. The even better news is that you don't see it. We don't see it. We humans can't see that change, but the algorithms could because they had more granularity. And the great news is that the doctor decided to change the medication of the patient, even though she didn't see anything wrong, just because she trusted the artificial intelligence system. And because of that, this woman is alive today, because the doctors believed in the uh, inputs of the artificial intelligence system. And when we have cases like that, we, don't, we actually share them with other doctors and nurses and build a virtuous cycle where each case builds more and more trust in the system to save more and more lives. And today, 20,000 people are alive because doctors believed in the indications that came from the system. So what you see here on the screen is actually the results of over one million patients using this technology. Reduction in time in the hospital, reduction in readmissions from outside the hospital back in, fewer pressure ulcers, falls, ICU days, and most importantly, fewer deaths from cardiac and respiratory arrest because that trust is built between artificial and human minds. So now that we've seen one example of a technology, let's take a step back and see the big picture. Our medical system is in crisis. We are missing over one million doctors and nurses to take care of all of us, and it's actually getting worse. In the United States, where we have the most advanced technology of uh, health, and introduce new artificial intelligence solutions every day, and costs of care are going up, they're actually skyrocketing. Amazingly, life expectancy is going down. Think about it. More money is spent, the greatest and best technology is being used every day, and people actually live less. Why is that? It's again because we are not able to make that connection between the advanced medical systems and driving the change in care to improve outcomes. So what can we all do about that? And what can we learn from this one technology example to improve overall care? So if we are developers of advanced medical systems, we need to make our systems worthy of human trust. They need to be accurate, they need to have strong scientific proof, they need to be transparent, and they need to focus on the interaction and the driving of the change in care. For all of us health consumers, we can also do some things about it. We live in an unprecedented time where we have access to sensors and medical applications on our smartphone like never before. There are sensors that measure our blood pressure and our heart and tell us how to exercise and when we need medical attention. Sensors that measure our sleep and tell us how to improve our sleep and our overall health with that and even sensors that measure our microbiome, the viruses and bacteria in our gut, and help us 
find the right and choose the right food that integrate well with what works for us. And these are not textbook suggestions copied from a book. These are personalized recommendations based on our own data collected with sensors, tailored to us to improve our health. So like a pilot flying, through his, flying her plane through cloud cover and trusting the instruments of her plane to get her through the clouds to safety, so must we trust artificial intelligence to drive us to better care and care better for ourselves. If there is one thing I've learned from this fascinating journey to improve my daughter's breathing, and she today is thankfully a brilliant, healthy young woman, if there is one thing I've learned is that her health, her life, and the life of all of us is too precious to risk just because of unbased or baseless fears of robotic medical systems, just because we all saw too many Terminator movies. Artificial intelligence does not diminish our humanity. On the contrary, it unleashes new capabilities. It empowers us to do the one unique human thing that only we humans can do, to care. So open your minds, open your hearts, take a breath, and don't just, don't just trust artificial intelligence, partner closely with it to care for yourselves and your loved ones. Thank you very much. That's how it's going.